food for thought. Thank you so much, Dr. Morgan. We're going to go right into our next session. And this session, uh, you have to fasten your seat belts because this is going to be a little bit unusual for our Kingdom Summits. We decided this year to tackle some issues that are current and that have not been traditionally addressed in Kingdom set settings. So today we're going to talk about applying the Kingdom to socio-ethnic issues. Applying the Kingdom to socio-ethnic issues. So let's begin. Socio ethnic issues include things like racism and social justice. These are two of the popular ones that we are hearing about now. How does the kingdom relate to social justice? Well, one interesting thing about the kingdom is that racism and social injustice are actually impossible in the kingdom. Think about it for a minute. It's impossible. It's impossible for the kingdom of God to produce social injustice because God's system is a perfect system. The kingdom is a perfect system. Now the problem is that there are many in the kingdom who do not, who do not understand the kingdom and therefore they misinterpret and misconstrue what God says about um, some of these issues. Think about this. How many times have you heard Jesus quoted when it came to social justice issues, racism, anything else? I, ha I have hardly ever heard Jesus quoted. But who has the most profound statements about social justice and racism in the, in, in the history of the world in Jesus. Let me give you an example. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 35. This is a, this is a, a prescription for dealing with race, racism. Here's what he says. It says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. You know, people used to like to test Jesus. The Pharisees, the, the, the political elites of that day, they all wanted to test Jesus. But here's what happened. It says, he said to him, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What is, what is your reading of it? And you know what I like about Jesus? Whenever people ask Jesus a question, he asked them a question. And the reason he asked them a question was because he had more knowledge than them and he could stare them into their own trap that they were trying to set. So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And then this smart man who was trying to test Jesus, he came up with a wonderful question to confuse Jesus or, or, to, or to cause Jesus some um, mental harm. He said, who is my neighbor? And listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, you have answered rightly. He said, he, Jesus said, you know what? Now I'm going to bring it home. Get ready for the boom. He says, you have, you, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he wanting to justify himself to, to Jesus said, who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered him and said, a certain man went down to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he arrived, and so on. And then it says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was and showed compassion on him. So now let me show you how Jesus was eliminating racism. First of all, the Samaritans were known as dogs. In our days, you could say a Samaritan is equivalent to a nigger. 
So Jesus was telling him that in understanding human nature and understanding how God created us, this man is asking, who is your neighbor? And Jesus is saying, it's, Jesus is saying you know, everybody's equal. You would think that the Levite would be the one who would care for the person. You would think that the person in your social class or your social club would be the one who would be better than someone else. And Jesus was showing that God created everyone equal and everyone is capable of doing good. He wasn't saying that the Levite couldn't do good. He said in this instance, the Levite didn't do good. And he, he, he prescribed this message just for this scholar. He was clearing up misconceptions. And that's why it's so important when we think about social justice to make sure the narrative begins with Jesus. It begins with the kingdom perspective. Because if you have social justice and if you're trying to combat racism by convoluted humanistic thinking, you end up doing more damage than good. And I'm gonna share some things that illustrate that. It says, so when he went to him, he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal. So which of these do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among thieves? So now this man, who was obviously a racially prejudiced person, Jesus confronted him and said, okay, now tell me who is your neighbor? And the man had no choice but to understand what Jesus saying, was saying and admit the truth. So Jesus cured him of racism. Listen to this. He says, so which of these do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, the one who showed mercy on him. What else could he, could he have said? And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, Go thou and do likewise. I, I like how Jesus dealt with people. I mean, God in the flesh was so cold. You know, people would come to him to try to confuse him and come with all kind of convoluted philosophies. And then he'd look at him and say, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> and you might add this into that. And Jesus dropped the mic. That's from Davy B. 6 and 8. <laughs> So, the kingdom response to social justice is clear. Social justice and racism becomes perverted because the kingdom is not revealed or applied to these situations. When, 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 when the kingdom is not applied to social justice situations, you know what happens? It becomes perverted. Let me give you an example. The church is often way behind the culture in addressing these issues. So when the people who rise up and address the issues speak, the only thing you are going to have is convoluted language because these are lost people. When you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, that should have been started by someone in the kingdom. And you, in fact, if you read that scripture that Jesus, um, that, that I read that Jesus quoted a little bit earlier, Jesus said, black lives matter. He said, Samaritan lives matter. Are going to hear is a convoluted message. The, the Black Lives Matter movement has good intention. But if you have the wrong people with the wrong philosophies leading it, then it becomes convoluted. The kingdom perspective is, is often missing. Now, let's take a look at racism, for example. Racism is interesting. You know, we act as if racism just came around lately. But Jesus dealt with racism in his day. 
Racism is very old. Racism, racism happens everywhere, and racism is in every culture. Let me give you some historical examples. You had the German white supremacy. You had the Aryan superiority over Jews. You had the Dutch in South Africa superiority over Africans, Indians, and dark-skinned people. The British and white superiority over black Americans. Arab superiority over Europeans. And let me pause there for a moment. When we talk about history, we don't realize that in the same way white people or people with white skin have dominated black people, it was reversed at one point in time. Do your research on this. Do your research on the Barbary Coast. The Arabs of what, is called, what was called the Barbary Coast at that time, they enslaved Europeans. Europe was enslaved. The white people were slaves. So when we start thinking about racism, we start to associate it with a skin color, which is the dumbest thing that you could ever do. Here's an, another excerpt that I read from, from a source. Islam's black slaves. It estimates that the total number of African slaves shipped to the Muslim world at 11.5 to 14 million. So we, we focus in on what happens with white people today because white people in the Western world have been dominant. But racism has been everywhere and in every group. So you can't even pay attention to skin color when it comes to racism because racism really doesn't have anything to do with skin color. Racism is about ideology. If racism was associated with skin color, then every, black, every white person would, in, in today's context, every white person would automatically be racist. They can't help it. But if you can help it, it means that it's a mental thing. It's what you learned, it's what you've been accustomed to. So let's talk a little bit about how to understand and defeat racism from a kingdom perspective. Now, I'm gonna reference America in a lot of this because America is, on the, is in the news a lot when it comes to racism. Here's a problem that we have. This is a big problem. We do not admit, when I say we do not, I'm speaking for America. Do not admit the truth about history. It's amazing that European history and American history is a history of denial. Let me give you some examples. What we call the Americas is not, what we call America is not really America, you know. You had British colonialists who came to a country that already had its own government, even if it may be primitive or whatever it was, their own people, their own systems, and they came and took their land and killed them and dispersed them over the country. I don't know how many of you have heard of the Trail of Tears, but I remember going to the Indian Museum. The, 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 the government, you know, and, 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 and it's not necessarily that, okay, all of these people were bad people, but this is some bad stuff. And you have to admit it. You can't just say, well, you know, um, the, our, our pilgrims were great people and our forefathers were great people and everything they did was good. No, no, man, there's some deep stuff that happened and you have to admit it because if you want the truth to prevail, you have to admit the truth. America was a British colony, but the only problem was Britain didn't own the colony. The colony was already owned and inhabited by people. It was actually Native American land and law. I don't know if you noticed today, but many, many of you may, may recognize this. America is still not one nation. If you drive to Oklahoma, if you drive, if you go to Miami, they have some, something called the Seminole Nation. And land in, the, in America is still divided. I'm gonna show you something in a minute from Oklahoma. So 
these are some of the things that we need to admit. Um, you had racism all over the world, and what happened is that history has been written and history has ignored the, the truth. If we want to change and we want to be effective, we need to first of all admit the truth and then make changes. So for America to change, America needs to say, look, the founders of America did some terrible things and we need to make it right. We can't go back and reverse it, but we can admit it because if you don't admit it, then change is not possible. If you act like, well, you know, um, we, 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 we came to America and there was nobody there and we took it over and it's our land and this is our heritage. No, no, my brother. You stole the people's land. You negotiated treaty, treaties that were, that were not good for them. And, and, you know, this kind of talk, you know, people would get angry at you and they'll say, you know, what are you doing? Well, all I'm doing is saying what Jesus did. You have to admit the truth. Now, on the screen is a map of America when the British colonists came. So when the British colonists came, there were the Crow Indians, the Cheyenne, the Apparatio, the Pawnee, the Comanche, the Chickasha, the Cherokee, the Creek, the Choctaw, the Natchez, the Seminole, the Massachusetts, the Perot, and so on. They already had the nation <laughs> mapped out. And then America came in and said, no, no, your name is Florida. Your name is such and such. Now, this is, this is very important, okay? So, we have to admit. Now, let me, let, me, let me show you something. This just happened last month. Listen to this. There was a ruling in Oklahoma as we said that a vast chunk of Oklahoma, including much of Tulsa, the state's second largest city, was made up of Indian, currently made up of Indian reservations. So they are saying that, you know, the city of Tulsa actually belongs to the Indians. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And sometimes, you know, these things happen and we, we don't see it. It says, the decision barred prosecution of Native Americans on those lands by the state. So the state of Oklahoma cannot prosecute an Indian in Tulsa. It says, all local law enforcement saying they must instead face justice in the federal or tribal. So now, let's talk about how to correct all of this. America's misconceptions. America initially never belonged to white people from Britain. However, things have happened in history and America became a nation. But you have to admit that when you became a nation, you became a nation under these circumstances. If we look at the Bahamas, the Bahamas is friendly to Britain or England, but we were also victimized by England. Now what's interesting is that when you read the history books, you read history about slavery, but it's, 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 it's shown from the perspective of the slave the, the slavers. The slave story have never been told. Even when you look at African history, there's no such thing as African history because Africans have never told their history. African history has been told by Europeans and Americans. Are you with me? Okay, hold on to, hold on to your seatbelt, okay? Americans fought the British over a country the British did not own. The land was already populated. These are facts, un undisputable facts. Even today, the USA is not one country. The, the Americans or the British colonists who formed America bribed and coerced the Indians into unethical agreements and put them on reservations. 
put their reserve land for them. They said, okay, we're going to take over your land. However, we will be nice to you and we will give you some spots to live in your country. Are you with me? Some rough stuff. Everybody say rough stuff. Now, remember this. The kingdom, we, we're talking about the kingdom and social bus, justice. Racism is not about skin color. The, pro, the problem that we are running into now is people are attributing character, behavior, and, and other characteristics to a skin color. Dumbest thing that you can do. It's almost like you saying that one house is better than the other because of the color paint on the house. The house is really what's on the inside. It's not the paint. But when you focus in on the paint and you make the paint into something special, you know, one of the most dangerous things that can happen for black people is for black people to attribute skin color to something important. Skin color is what you are born with. Skin, skin color comes from melanin. Melanin is inanimate. It doesn't have any character or quality. It simply colors you. It's like paint on a house. When you start to attribute something special, then you engage in racism. So what we all have to do, everyone of every color, is just appreciate your color because you, don't, you didn't have a part in getting that color and you can't change it. So just appreciate it and let's all live together, celebrate life and, and everybody um, follow what the kingdom perspective is, amen? Racism is an ideology, and racism is not limited or specialized to any one color. Now, we know that in the last um, 50, 100 years, that white people have been the primary purveyors of racism in, in the Western world. But black racism exists. Intra-black racism exists. You know. Um, What's interesting about the, the, the black race is, you know, sometimes we ignore racism within the black community or colorism, as you would call it. Um, the thing about it is that racism is bad wherever it happens, and so we need to eliminate racism altogether and understand that racism is not about color, it's about ideology, and we have to defeat the ideology, not the color. If you kill white people, you don't, de you, you don't defeat racism. Because racism is an idea. It's a very bad idea, but it's an idea. In order to defeat racism, you have to defeat the idea. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus said, which one of these is your neighbor? And he picked the neighbor that was despised, disparaged, and undervalued so that the person who wanted to discriminate against that particular neighbor would recognize that, hey, you know, everybody has value. And Jesus had a way of correcting all of these situations in the most simplistic fashion. And if we would apply it to today, it would eliminate our problems when it comes to racism. And the church or the kingdom of God needs to step to the forefront. We need to lead. We need to speak up. You know, when racism happens, we need to talk about the solution. We need to quote Jesus. How can you address racism without quoting God? Who showed you how to deal with it in the scripture? No one decides their skin color. I, I want to find one person who decided their skin color. Some people say Michael Jackson, but that's not true. No one decides their skin color. So what do you do? Embrace your heritage, celebrate your heritage, but do not worship your heritage. Do not worship your, if you start worshiping your heritage, then you are elevating yourself and you are getting into a racist mode. Are you with me? Say this with me. Say the kingdom is social justice. You see, you cannot have justice without the justifier. And the justifier tells us how to have justice. So when we talk about social justice, it begins with the justifier. 
Let me give you another example. This is a very powerful example. Dinner with a tax collector. So Jesus, once again, is putting these guys in school. It says, then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into the sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus saw him, well, let me, let me pause for a minute. Let, let's, let's talk a little bit about who Zacchaeus was. Jesus chose these persons to teach lessons. He chose the Samaritan to teach a lesson. He chose Zacchaeus. Why would he invite, why would he, he, he say, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house to dinner? Because the people of that day had an opinion about people like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is, was what is called a publican. A publican, they said the only thing worse than a sinner was a publican. You know what a publican did? A publican was a Jew who worked for the Roman Empire and collected taxes. The Roman Empire allowed them to, to tax people extra and pocket the difference. So whenever a Jew saw a publican, they were incensed. Okay, so what did Jesus do? So he came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must, go, I must stay at your house. Now, can you imagine the people of that day? The people of that day looking at what in the world is this Jesus fellow doing? He is off his mind. This guy is a publican. He doesn't deserve any social justice. He's a criminal. So he made haste and came down and received them joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus, they don't tell us what happened between these statements. It says, then Zacchaeus. Understand the kingdom representing the kingdom and when you have people who don't understand the kingdom representing the kingdom they start to do things that are an embarrassment to the kingdom instead of an advancement of the kingdom but here it is it says once Zacchaeus once the kingdom was revealed to Zacchaeus he stood up and said look Lord I will give half my goods to the poor now who asked him to give half his goods to the poor it was the revelation of God that caused it to happen. It says, and if I have taken it from anyone by false accusation, I will restore fourfold. He's saying, if I have taken, he knows he took. It says, and Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is the son of Abraham. So you know what he's saying? He's saying, this man was a publican, a tax collector, but I wanted to show you all that everybody is valuable in, in God's eyes, even the ones who have messed up. And see, sometimes we point our finger at the white man and we forget us. We are all sons of Abraham when we come into the kingdom and his grace covers all of us. It's like when you go to the cleaners you know, when you go to the cleaners, you take your clothes, you have varying levels of dirt. Some clothes have a little small spot. Some clothes are full of dirt, but they all look the same when they come out of the cleaners. And that's what Jesus does. Jesus changes the way we look once we enter the kingdom and have an understanding of the kingdom. And listen to the statement of Jesus. He said, for the son of man has come to seek and save that which is lost. He said, my priority is not skin color. It's not your, your social status. It's none of these things. He said, I came to save anyone who is lost. 
So a publican can be lost. The poor man on the street can be lost. The black man can be lost. The white man can be lost. Anybody can be lost. I came to save all the lost people. Are you a lost person? I came to save you. And you see, when we see the kingdom perspective, it changes the way we approach. Here's the deal. Whenever the kingdom shows up, the, when, whenever the kingdom shows up, the narrative changes. What do I mean? We have to remember that we have to put the kingdom before ethnicity. What I find with some of my friends in America that they, they are doing now is they are putting ethnicity before the kingdom. So blackness is more important than the kingdom. And blackness really, outside of context, is a waste of time. Because melanin, you had nothing to do with it. You can influence or change it. It's something, it's a characteristic that you are born with. So what are you, why, why are you, you gonna worship melanin? Why are you gonna worship the paint on the house? The inside of the house is what's important. And guess what? Everybody's house, no matter what paint on it, can be good or bad. The fact that the white man has been dominant doesn't mean that the white man is any worse than the black man. If white people lived in Africa and black people lived in, in Europe and pulled them to America, the same thing would happen. And don't say it can happen because history has taught us that man does things to man because man is, is, is lives in, living in a sinful state. So never think that one group of people is different from another group of people. The problem is the ideology. The problem is, it's, and it's a spiritual thing, okay? So don't put ethnicity before the kingdom. Jesus said, seek first the what? Your skin color. He said, seek first your social status. He said, you know, um, make as a priority your blackness or whiteness. You see, our problems begin when we put ethnicity before skin color. And actually, when you come into the kingdom, huh? Ethnicity before God, sorry. Before the kingdom. Okay, let's continue. What is the kingdom perspective on social justice and racism? You cannot place any cause above the kingdom because the solution to every cause is the kingdom. We are placing causes above the kingdom. So in some circles, black lives matter, or if it were white lives matter, or blue lives, or orange lives, we have placed some of these things before the kingdom, but the solution to these things is the kingdom. So you have to put the kingdom first, and if you look at how Jesus handled those situations, he solved the problem. You know, Jesus solved the problem for us many, many years ago, and we haven't figured it out. You know what he said? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I mean, that's all, that's all you need. That solves racism, it solves you know, every issue that you face. Embrace your heritage, but do not worship your heritage. You know, I've talked to a number of people and they are creating black gods. That is so dumb. God is not a color. Actually, we should have no images of God, period. We should have no photographs of Jesus. It's a tremendous injustice that has been done to the world to have a photograph and say, this is Jesus or this is Mary. There were no cameras there. No one know what they look like. And the pictures that we have seen are certainly 100% not what he looked like. But we don't have to focus on what he looked like because that's irrelevant. It wasn't his sin color. It wasn't his skin color. It was the sin color he came to deal with. And he corrected the sin color so the skin color is irrelevant. You see, if whenever skin color is relevant, we remain divided. And the kingdom is divided sometimes based upon skin color. 
But those who truly understand the kingdom understand that the sin color is more important than the skin color. You had nothing to do with where you were born or the color of your skin, so just be thankful that you were here. Elevate each other and not dominate each other. And don't try to overcompensate based upon your race or ethnicity. So now I'm gonna give you some solutions as we get ready to wrap up. Here's what we need to do. First of all, we need to introduce and apply the kingdom in, in, in whatever environment we're in. Introduce and apply the kingdom to the discussion. Quote Jesus. Explain to those who are, who are arguing about racism that racism is impossible in the kingdom, and you show them the scripture. Get rid of racial superiority, and guess what? Do not profile white people or black people. You know, sometimes um, we say white people profile us, and then we turn around and say all white people are, are racist. You're doing the same thing, and you are perpetuating a falsehood. You are not guilty or reason. You, you're not guilty by reason of race or skin color. You are guilty or innocent by reason of evidence. But we have elevated skin color into the mix that skin color can make you right or wrong. Melanin is neutral. Your ideology comes from your brain and your spirit. It doesn't come from your skin. The, the reason racism exists is because somebody presented an idea and they passed it on to other people. So what we, what we need to do now is we need to change the information. We need to bring a new idea. We need to introduce the idea that Jesus explained to the Samaritans and the Jews. We need to introduce what Jesus said. He came to save all that were lost, not any particular group. We have to adopt principles that elevate us. The kingdom formula is so powerful and simple. I mean, so powerful and simple. The kingdom formula. You know what the kingdom formula is? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That solves the problem. And we must lead. Everybody say we must lead. Now, reparations and social justice are an issue. Let me tell you why I say that. When I talked about admitting the truth of history, you can't admit the truth and then don't try to do anything about it. So for example, you know, some people say, well, you know, um, those things happened long ago and you know, we shouldn't do anything about it. In the kingdom, justice is a part of the concept of the kingdom, restoring to people what they have lost. What happened in America was an injustice. What happened to the Indians, what happened to the black people. So America should, should figure out what is the best way to bring restorative justice. How can you restore the value of people that you caused to be devalued, and not, not you in this generation, but your forefathers. Um, every government is responsible for what it did even from its inception. You can't say, well, you know, we're only responsible for the last 30 years. You know, when I, when I went to school in America, you know, when I first went to America, um, I didn't understand the problems of black America until the first school that I went to and we went across the tracks. And then I began to realize, this is an incredible injustice. And sometimes what we do nowadays is we minimize it. We don't admit this was a terrible injustice and we need to correct it. And how do you correct it? Well, reparations are not out of order. Because if you stole the people's land in, in, the, in the case of the Indians, um, you know, the, America has made some peace with the Indians and given them some concessions. But when you look at it, it's nowhere near what should have been done for what happened. And that should still be addressed. I'm talking about from a kingdom perspective. And the leaders of America should take responsibility for it. The black people in America 
who were damaged, there should be some form of reparation. Now, it doesn't have to be money, because if it's money, when I say money, it may include money, but it, it shouldn't be primarily money, because if it's money, then it doesn't change anything. Because you could give a lot of people money, and their pants hanging down here, and they run to the store and buy some new Nikes, and, and get some rims and, <laughs> and a couple other things, buy, buy, buy a couple of cases of liquor, and next thing you know, they broke us before. <laughs> So you have to give things like free education, you have to give land, property, business opportunities, and things like that, all right? Okay, everybody say corrections need to be made. So we have to make corrections. Reparations are important. And then we have to look at future opportunities, for example, digital opportunities, opportunities for Self-actualization. You know, my son is on Wall Street, and there's an interesting thing that's happening on Wall Street. One of the good things that have happened out of the protests is that it has hit the conscience of some of the elites in, in the U.S. So my son works for Goldman Sachs, and one of the things that's happened is that they have instituted a program now where they are creating career paths for black and brown people. Because on Wall Street, you know, um, on these firms, I remember going on the floor with him at another com company that he worked with before us, Goldman Sachs. And I stood on the floor, and there were over 700 people on the floor. Two people were black. So we have to change the narrative. Okay, and that's, that's, that's all a part of social justice. God expects us to make corrections where egregious offenses have occurred. Here's what we have to do as kingdom citizens. Enter positions of influence and introduce and apply the kingdom. That's why you have to be in ownership. That's why you have to be in leadership. I was talking to a member of our church recently, and he said to me, he said, he said, Pastor Dave, I listened to your message, and I went to join my neighborhood association. Because I realized that if the kingdom is going to influence my neighborhood, they need me. You cannot expect people who are non-citizens of the kingdom to create a kingdom citizenry. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world. Why did he say go into all the world? You know what he could have said? Um, I will make the world into the kingdom of God. No, he said, you go, because if you don't go, it's not going to happen. So you have to go. We all have to go. We have to become proactive voices. We have to educate and train entrepreneurs. Whenever there are protests, the protest should be, become a movement, and the movement should be based upon the kingdom. And in order for that to happen, kingdom citizens had to be, have to be at the center of the movement. We are yeast. So what do yeast, yeast do? What does salt do? Salt goes in the middle of situations and changes the flavor of it. And that's what we are assigned to do. There are opportunities coming in terms of social justice, but we have to be prepared for, for it. My time is up. Um, I, if you want, I wanna, I'll send you some of the um, information that I have, some of the sources that I've gotten some of this material from. But I just wanna close by saying this. You know, this is an issue that has not gotten a lot of traction in the kingdom circle, the church circle, whatever circle you want to call it. But this is just as important as everything else we do. And we can no longer allow ourselves to be on the sidelines when it comes to these issues. You have to speak up because if you don't speak up, if you don't get involved, if you don't direct the narrative, then we are going to be victims of a narrative that is convoluted. So what ends up happening now is that a narrative that is supposed to be enhancing the life of black people is infiltrated 
with philosophies that will damage black people forever. The Black Lives Matter movement, they, the leaders started out saying, look, we don't believe in nuclear family. Man and woman and gender and all, no, we don't believe in none of that. How, what does that have to do with, with black lives? But you see, if we don't step up, the devil will show up. And the results will be a lot of casualties. But the kingdom is here. And like Jesus said, I have come to save. Who is your neighbor? Go thou and do likewise. God bless you.